David, tell us a little bit about you. Well, thanks, Melissa. I, uh, I'm from Maine. Uh, I grew up there. And in fact, I didn't get on an airplane until I was 20 years old. Uh, for me, going to Boston was a big deal. Uh, and when I did get on a plane, it was to go to Boston, then go to Rome in my junior year in college. And I never stopped traveling after that. I, I spent 10 years almost, nine or 10 years as a journalist, and uh, 30, almost 35, 34 years and 10 months as a diplomat. Uh, and I left the Foreign Service in late 2016. And instead of becoming a pundit or a member of a think tank or whatever, I decided I'd do what I really like, and that's paint. So here I am. Where were your formidable artist uh, skills starting at? Well, my, my mother and grandmother uh, were both amateur artists. Uh, my mother was convinced when I brought a robin home from, from first grade that I was, I was the next Rembrandt. <clears throat> and uh, she always encouraged me. But, you know, I didn't have the brains to take art courses in college. I, I was doing other things. But I always have drawn since I was early, as early as I can remember. Um, and the other things that affected me were, uh, uh, I had eight years of Latin and three of Greek. I wanted to be an archaeologist, but I thought it was impractical. So I went down the path of journalism, probably to my parents' relief uh, instead. And then a diplomat for 30, I did, I was a journalist for nine years, I think, and then a diplomat for 34 years and 10 months. Did you do any of that painting while you were on the job still? Like, was it already seeping in? Yeah, in fact, the, the way this started was I was appointed ambassador to Algeria in 2008. And the security situation in Algeria was kind of tough. Um, you couldn't just go wherever you wanted. And so uh, I, I did, you know, if, the thing is I had all these weekends free and I couldn't really just get in the car and go somewhere without a great big security detail and so forth. And if the ambassador goes into the embassy, it kind of makes everybody else feel like they have to go into the embassy. So I decided, well, that would be a nasty thing to do. So I didn't do that. And what I did is I started this course of self-study, serious self-study in drawing, perspective, and color. And uh, I, I went at it quite methodically. And that naturally led to watercolors. And that's how I started doing this. So initially, I, of course, I was just doing it for the zen of it for myself. But I did hang some of my paintings in the official residence in Algiers. And we did do a little show at the embassy atrium for all the artists in the community. And I put some of my stuff up there. And people started to ask me, well, can we have prints of this? Can we maybe is have for sale? And I always had to say no. Uh, as long as I was in the Foreign Service, I couldn't sell anything because uh, you, you might not know it these days, but there are things called ethics rules. And one of the big ones is that you never use your official position to promote your personal interests. And so as long as I was in the Foreign Service, I couldn't sell a thing. But as I went from Algiers to Afghanistan, where I painted some more, and that you can see that in a number of the prints and, uh, and paintings that I did at that time, uh, and then again in Greece, uh, I kept doing it and I kept getting more and more queries about, well, is that for sale? Can I have a print? And I kept saying, no, no, no. And in Greece, I did hang some of my paintings in the official residence and I got a lot of, you know, good comments. So that was encouraging. And the other thing that happened in Greece was kind of funny. Uh, my public affairs officer said, well, Mr. Ambassador, you have to go on Twitter. I said, well, I don't want to do that. What, what do I want to go on Twitter for? And he said, no, 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 you've got to do it because you're the voice of the embassy and, and so forth. So, okay. So I reluctantly agreed to go on Twitter. When you go on Twitter, okay, you, you put out your official policy stuff and you put out articles of interest, but then you're supposed to put out something personal to make it human. And I had no, I wasn't going to put out my family photos. So the public affairs guy said, well, put out your watercolors and your paintings. And I said, oh, come on. And they said, yeah, 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 do it. Well, I did it, and long story short, the Greeks like the watercolors better than anything, even more than the policy pronouncements. And, you know, art is communicating, and, and by doing that, it made people feel, well, the ambassador's a human being, and he actually cares about our country and our culture, and he's not just sitting behind the embassy wall making up plots and thinking about how to cause trouble for us. Mentioning about watercolors being challenging, what about the media drew you to it? 
Well, I like uh, a challenge and I like puzzles and I like figuring things out. And I, I picked the watercolors. I experimented with oils in the 80s, um, but I picked watercolors because it's difficult. Uh, because you have to deal with the unexpected all the time. Um, in diplomacy, there are no do-overs. You know, if something happens, you have to make the best of the, uh, the situation and find a solution for it. It's the same thing in watercolor because you have all these little unexpected surprises all the time and you have to figure out what to do with it and how to make the best of it. So I really liked that. Uh, plus it's easier to clean up and, 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 and fairly uh, portable. And, uh, and so I just started with it and I have kept at it. David, how would you say your art has evolved over the years? I got there in late 2008 to Algiers. I didn't start this probably till early 2009. But then I went very systematically through, uh, you know, a course of uh, drawing and perspective and all, you know, the whole nine yards. And, and then a, a similar effort on color. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I really... Uh, think that you have to, it's so fundamental to watercolor to have a good drawing. If the mm -hmm. drawing is lousy, the painting's gonna be lousy. I mean, it's, if, unless it's an abstract, of course, and then of course that's a different matter, but for the kinds of things that I do, you, you know, if, if, the, if the perspective is out of whack or, the, or if it doesn't look right, if the drawing's crummy, then the painting's crummy. I, I began by uh, not only studying drawing and color, but also, you know, in Vasari's lives of the artists, uh, the way they used to learn was by copying old masters. So I was a big fan growing up in Maine, of course, of Winslow Homer. So I copied a number of Winslow Homer's paintings to learn, and uh, I still have them. Uh, my daughter has, I have one, my daughter has another, I, I've got a few. Um, so I think some of those first ones were probably influenced by Winslow Homer and people from Maine and New England, of course, like that. One of the ones that I got a lot of positive feedback on and still do is called Ram Island Light. That's the blue one with the uh, pen and ink of the water of the lighthouse and the sailboat going by. Um, that one uh, people like because of the, uh, it reminds them a lot of the, if you've been to Maine uh, in the summer, that's that really is a uh, reminiscent of that. And another thing which people like, I think, are the colors. I, mean, I tend to use um, a fairly limited palette whenever I do anything so that the colors, you know, I don't throw the whole kitchen sink in there. I, I like to see harmony in the whole color scheme of the painting. So I, I often will base it on maybe three or four colors. And if there's anything extra, it's usually just a little small piece here and there. But the overall key of the of the paintings, I think, and the color key, it can vary a lot, but what's important is that it be harmonious. What is your process? Do you photograph the landscape you're about to paint, or do you sit in front of the landscape and paint? How do you get your idea onto your canvas? My, my process is, it's not a photo and it's not a sketch. Um, it could just be staring at something long enough, because what... For me, the key thing is what is it about this situation, about this place that makes me want to paint it? And the first thing is to figure that out. Uh, I mean, what is it about this scene? And you have to really think hard about it. Is it the whole thing or is it just this part of it? Well, if it's just this, is it going to, is it going to be a better composition if it's a portrait or if it's a landscape aspect, right? And then what about it? What is it about it that um, you need to highlight in the composition? So you have to think carefully about the idea of the thing and then the composition of the thing. And then maybe the most important step of all is what are the values? Where are the darks? Where are the midtones? Where are the lights? Where are the parts that are gonna be unpainted? Because in watercolor, the light comes from the paper and every bit of paint that you put on it takes away light from the paper. So you have to preserve that light. And the other thing about watercolor is it is because of the nature of the medium, you have to do it directly and with confidence. You, it, a big mistake beginners make is they do little tiny, the little small brushes and little strokes. And, you know, it looks messy. Uh, if to be effective, it has to be done confident. Well, you can't do that if you don't know 
have in mind clearly what you want to do. That's why it's so important before you ever start to paint to figure out the idea, to figure out the composition, to figure out the values. And then when you've got the values, then you do a drawing. And only then, last of all, and easiest of all in a way, is to do the actual painting. Because when you start to paint, you've got in your mind what it is you're trying to do and why you want to do it and where things need to be. It may not come out exactly as you had in mind, but at least you, you, you have some mental moorings going into it. You don't start a painting think, oh, gee, maybe I'll use a little yellow here or a little brown there. Uh, well, gee, that doesn't look so good. No, you have to have in mind before you start where you want to end up. Do you have a painting that started out as very challenging, but then grew to be one of your favorite paintings? It's a, it's a painting called The Wreck of the Annie Maguire. This was a very big painting. It's the biggest one I've done. It's like 22 by 28. It's quite a large uh, piece. And this was, a, this was showing a shipwreck on Christmas Eve in 1886 at a lighthouse off of Portland, Maine. And the thing is, I didn't have an actual picture to go by or even a photograph, just descriptions. I had photographs of the ship when the sea was not angry, when it was just lying on the rock. And I had, and I knew it, because I've been there many times, I knew what the sea was like um, when the storm really blew up. And I didn't want to do a conventional lighthouse painting, you know, with white lighthouse and the blue sky and the red roofs. Everybody who ever does it or takes a picture does the same thing. And I wanted to do something totally different. So I did this winter storm scene and I made the lighthouse secondary. It's off to the side. And the key thing is the clash in the middle of the rocks, the ship, and the sea. And I thought that says a lot about the hazards of going to sea and all that stuff and how this happened and men in the sea and whatnot. So that was, became the focal point. Well, that was hard to do because doing water that is that violent, it's not easy. And doing a ship with all of its rigging and getting it in proportion to the lighthouse and the rocks, and the, you know, that was a real challenge. But it came out uh, pretty well in the end, I think. And uh, um, my wife won't let me sell it. <laughs> oh, that, I can do prints. Yeah, well, you know, that might be the, the family treasured piece there. So, you know, there are some art that stays within, a, within the family and that might be a family member for you guys there. Thank you, David Pierce, for sharing your art experience with us. If you go to the description below, you will find a link to David's collections on geogalleries.com. If you'll hit subscribe and notify, you'll be able to join us every first Friday for another interview with an artist or photographer from Geo Galleries. We wish you a great day.